This is an enthralling story spanning four decades involving priceless artefacts, deception, kidnapping, resultant changes to international law and even Britain's highest court. And it all begins in a Taranaki swamp of orphans. But before I tell you more, we probably need to focus on exactly what we are talking about in terms of an artefact. Art and artefacts come in many mediums, although when one reads the headline Art Heist, you do tend to think about paintings. I've covered what I would call a conventional armed robbery of an Auckland gallery previously, and there's a link to that one in the description. Onwards. Figurines, jewellery are another two perceptions when we are on the subject. That photo I took in Lima, by the way. In this particular case, we happen to be talking about panels. To explain and elaborate further, here are a series of pictures which will give you a good idea of what we're talking about. The largest one, by the way, is 1.5 metres high. Essentially, they are elaborately carved wooden panels that together makes one piece of art. Originally, the five, in this case, would have decorated a Maori storage house called a pataka. Here are a variety of patakas. Given they were carved over 175 years ago, they are extremely rare and hold immense cultural significance for the iwi, or tribe. The five panels in question were rediscovered in 1972, much by accident, in a swamp in Motunui, on North Island's west coast, an area best known for its ethanol plant. This wasn't the first time carved panels had been found in the swamp either. In 1960, a single panel pictured was recovered and ended up in the Taranaki Museum. Luckily for posterity, that panel was scooped up by a digger intact. That single panel was also related to the other five. Not part of the same group, but likely to have been created by the same skilled carver. That area was searched extensively in the 1960s as it was transferred from swamp to farmland. These are pupils from Waitara High School out digging in 1960. The identity of the local Mary man who discovered the five panels in 1972 after a series of get down and dirty searches remains unknown, hidden behind a pseudonym. If my basic te reo Māori is correct, Manu Koonga translates loosely as noisy bird. Why are all these precious wooden panels turning up in a swamp of all places, I hear you ask? This is relatively easy to explain. There are good parallels between the loot hiding habits of Maori and say the Vikings. If you felt threatened or on the move, you buried the preciouses somewhere inconspicuous and came back later and retrieved it whilst no one was looking. And if you died, the burial location sometimes died with you. In this case, the panels were submerged in approximately 1830. At this stage of the game, a centuries old intertribal rivalries were being supercharged with the introduction of muskets. Smaller tribes formed alliances to fight off or deter larger groups of invaders. Battles were won and lost. Raids commonplace. A large chunk of the central North Island was in a state of flux as different iwis fought for control and even survival as an entity. No one can be 100% sure on the creators of the panels, but it is likely to have been the Te Ati Awa. Rather rude of me to get this far without giving an idea of the location for all of this. Anyway, Mano Kawanga knew his find was worth something. Not exactly how much that something was though. They were stored in his garage for a few months whilst he thought about what to do. How he got in touch with the London antique dealer specialising in what is called tribal art is open to dispute. One article indicated he got on the blower to London and the other the dealer got a tip off about him. 
that dealer was and is Lance Entwistle, and he's still in the same game even today. You'll be wondering why in about 90 seconds. And by the way, I couldn't find a connection with him and the bassist from The Who, John Entwistle, in case you were wondering. But if you know better than me, is stick it in the comments. Realising he is onto a bargain, Entwistle made the trip down under and makes a deal to secure the panels of Mane Kawanga for a derisory sum of just 6000 New Zealand dollars. To find out their real value as at today, you'll have to wait to the end of the video. Due to their cultural and historic significance, items of this nature were and still are prohibited exports. The New Zealand Ministry of Culture and Heritage in partnership with the Customs monitors sales and the export of historical items. To introduce another Maori word, ta'onga means precious item or treasure. They can't leave the country without permission, if at all. That Customs Act relating to restricted imports dates all the way back to 1913. The specifics on how Mr Entwistle whisk away the panels to New York are unknown. What is known is the process was illegal. Stolen is how he has been described by descendants of the Carvers. Heist would be another applicable term. It was now 1973 and Entwistle was going to cash in his ill-gotten five chips. You will be thinking what I'm thinking. Surely potential buyers would be put off by their dodgy origins and the New Zealand government would get wind of it and call a halt to any sale. Entwistle had that covered. The origins of the panels, the written declaration from the seller that authenticates a particular art piece's history for prospective buyers, was, let me just say, at best, blurred. Entwistle knew names of private collectors who would love to get their hands on such artefacts, one of those being the Swiss-based George Ortiz. In April of 1973, Ortiz purchased the panels for US dollars, 65,000, and air freighted them to his Geneva Chateau and into his private collection. Entwistle provided the aforementioned Providence documents, basically a declaration of authenticity and origin, that were, as I've mentioned, false. As well as making Ortiz promise not to tell a soul for two years and him agreeing to never photograph them except for insurance purposes. The panels had disappeared from public view and at this point no one in New Zealand apart from Manukauanga knew they even existed. Ortiz, by the way, had one of the world's largest collections of tribal art. One of the biggest criticisms of tribal art, apart from taking any piece away from its cultural homeland, is it encourages pillaging, illegal archaeology. The panel's incognito status changed in dramatic fashion four years later. Ortiz's five-year-old daughter, Graziella, was kidnapped from outside their chateau. The couple went on television pleading for the safe return of their daughter. The kidnappers demanded a two million US dollar cash ransom. Now George was a wealthy man, but his family's fortunes were on the wane. Historically the family had made their money in Bolivia mining, at one point been amongst the top ten richest families in the world. Those glory days, however, were long over. Assets he had a plenty, cash little. Hardly sent off selected items from his primitive art collection to Sotheby's in London to auction. Amongst the 234 items in the catalogue were the Motunui panels. Their price tag had risen to 300,000 English pounds, approximately 600,000 New Zealand dollars to keep the values in one consistent currency. It was only then New Zealand authorities became aware of their existence and wanted to know exactly where did they come from. A writ from the New Zealand Attorney General was issued. This led to the panels being withdrawn from sale just three days before the auction started, pending authenticity. The rest of the auction went ahead and raised close to three million US dollars. Eleven days later, two million dollars in cash of what was left was left on the side of the highway for the Italian kidnappers to collect. The exchange took place and Graziella was thankfully returned unharmed. Now the Swiss police had taken a record of all the banknotes, 
and when a dead, bullet-ridden body of a known Italian Mafia associate was found in possession of some of the cash in France. The uh, European police then uh, focused on his mates. Most of the Italian kidnappers were later therefore caught, tried and imprisoned. Little to none of the cash was ever recovered. And Sotheby's returned all the unsold items back to Ortiz. The panels, however, they were in limbo. The government of New Zealand thought the government of England would be kinder to their plight. They were wrong. And try they did, over a prolonged period and under successive governments, depositions and legal attempts were made to repossess the panels in 1978, 1983, 1985, 1995, 2005 and 2007. Six legal challenges. In 1982, New Zealand even took that case to the House of Lords, losing when the Lords pointed out a major hole in the law. They said New Zealand law ended at the borders. That gap in international law led to changes to the related UNESCO convention to do with cultural property and illicit trade. Thus, the panels weren't going anywhere. Went back into the vault in the Geneva Chateau. A sea change to that situation and didn't occur till 2014. And by then George Ortiz had been dead a year and the New Zealand government had managed to broker a deal finally with his family. Before he died evidently George had wanted the panels and some of the other items in his collection returned to their countries of origin. Finally, after 42 years of being abroad, the Motunui panels would be coming back to New Zealand. Here is a portion of their homecoming, uh, courtesy of Maori Television. Ki te kāinga. Te hokinga mai, ki te wā kāinga. I rinu atu kautou i daru te pō, hokinga mai rā kautou i te pō, ki te pō, ki te pō, te pai i au, te o māro. Kua roa te iwi e tatari ana. O ngā uri whai pānga, he tūhono tanga nō tēne ki o rātou tīpuna. Kau ki te mahara ki a rātou, uh, me ngā mahi i oti i a rātou, me ngā whao, me ngā toki, uh, me ngā tapu-tapu i mau i a rātou, ko i rā nō ki te whakāro. Te ki te atu i ngā tauira, uh, ka hauki anō te whakāro ki a rātou, ki te wā i mahi ai rātou i ngā mai. He taonga e ne kwa whakahoki atu ki te iwi, i roto i tō rātou whakataunga tiriti me te kāwanatanga. Tagging along for the trip was George's widow Catherine and their son Nicholas. And Catherine said, We are very happy that this has come to be, and more so they are now displayed in the wonderful Pukariki Museum amongst their people. So what was New Zealand's greatest art heist worth? The sale price the taxpayer paid was 4.5 million New Zealand dollars roughly a 3.5 million US dollars at the time. Panels had now come full circle. They are now on display at the Puke Ariki Museum in New Plymouth. At the beginning I mentioned that this is where the lone 1960 panel ended up as well. As a side related story, Mary artifacts have shot up in popularity over the last decade. And this statue went close to surpassing the panels fetching 3.7 million NZ at Christie's auction in Paris this year 2021. No one knows how that exited New Zealand as well. The first overseas owner of the statue, a Scotsman who oversaw Salon's transfer from the Dutch to the British control, died in 1836. It ended up in Entwistle's possession as well at one point. It seems a great pity to have all this art in the sole province of a single collector out of the public's eye and in a walk-in safe in Geneva, for example. Mihi mihi, or thank you for tuning in. My tereo in Italian are rather rough, but I'm always happy to have a crack. Better to try and fail than not at all. Likes and subscribers are what keeps this study room project ticking. Don't forget that other video I told you about, about the brazen daylight sticker of the Auckland Gallery in the description below. That involved a ransom as well, another great Kiwi yarn, and a master criminal. That chap was not. Spot you next time for more interesting things. <laughs>